Thank you, sir. I would now like to introduce Professor Shanti Rajan, the keynote speaker for our conference. Professor Shanti Rajan is a senior HR professional with a cumulative experience of more than 30 years in human resource and academia. Professor Shanti is the director of Scottish Qualifications Authority as well as the director of Institution Development of University of Stirling, Ras e Khaima campus and SQA diplomas. She moved to academia in 2009 and has taught in many universities of repute in UAE, Vietnam, Malawi, Sri Lanka and Malaysia. Madam plays a major role in the development of strategies and operational plans that result in achieving the overall objective of the institution to be an academic centre of excellence. She holds a master's degree with specialization in strategic human resource management from University of Wollongong and is currently pursuing her doctorate in educational leadership from US. She has completed her postgraduate certification in teaching and learning from UK and her higher education teaching certificate from Derek Box Center of Teaching and Learning, Harvard University. Her core areas of specialization and research interests include strategic human resource management, OB, leadership and emotional intelligence. She is an affiliate member of Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport UK and a senior fellow of Higher Education Academy UK. She is a certified social and emotional intelligence coach from the Institute of Social and Emotional Intelligence Denver, Colorado and also a certified person in using positive psychology for coaching social and emotional intelligence. She serves as an advisory board member for a few academic institutions of repute. She was awarded the Commendation Teaching Impact Award 2020 in the individual category by University of Stirling, UK in May 2020. She was facilitated the prestigious Academic Leadership Award from Higher Education Forum India on the occasion of Teachers' Day event, September 2021. I welcome Madam and request her to address the conference. Namaste and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to this reflective and profound topic. Honorable dignitaries, speakers, Principal Dr. Swati Wahal, Professor Dr. Aravind Luhar, chairpersons of the session, all paper presenters, attendees, all supporting teaching staff of the conference, a very warm welcome. At the outset, my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Dr. Aravind and the conveners of Yusuf Ismail College for having me as a key speaker for this conference. I'm truly humbled. For a moment, we're going back in time. At the stroke of midnight hour, our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, while addressing the Constituent Assembly on August 14, 1947, said, When the world sleeps, India will awake to freedom. From that midnight hour to today's Atmanul Barbarat, in about 76 years, we indeed have made a quantum leap. Today, India's population account for almost 17% of the world population, and in these 75 years, India has been able to elevate the living standards of her people. Considering the sheer size of our country, with so much of diversity, this is by all means a huge achievement and success. From consolidating India's diversity into unity and propelling India toward nation building and weaving in industrial development and social and economic transformations and reforms, it's a revolution in its own right and space. The literacy rate in India in 1947 was estimated to be at 12% and the average life expectancy used to be 32 years or thereabouts. Till about 1947, there were fewer than 70 or 80 companies in India. And if we talk about education, about 20 universities. Besides these, most of the Indian citizens resided in villages and were dependent on agriculture for their livelihood. And this meant they were heavily dependent on monsoon for a good agriculture harvest. 
Those in non-agriculture sector were also dependent on the outcome of the agriculture sector for their survival. All these, without doubt, indicated that the new nation called India had to generate new jobs by creating new industries while giving a huge push to the agriculture productivity and a profitable market's place for its goods and fair returns to the producers of these goods. All these will have to be done while addressing the issues like rich and poor divide, then prevailing caste system, creating economic opportunities for all, providing access to education and healthcare for as many as possible and in the shortest time. So time was of the essence. The Industrial Policy Re Re Resolution of 1948 outlined India's approach toward the industrial development, continuous and sustained industrial growth, and increase an equitable distribution of the goods produced by these industries. This 1948 industrial policy also proposed a mixed economy, that is, an economic system that has both elements of capitalism and that of socialism. Small scale and cottage industries were also accorded a high priority by restricting foreign investments. And this was one of the greatest or the biggest factor in the development of Indi India industry landscape. In 1948 policy, divided industries in which some were under the purview of the central government monopoly and certain industries and mineral ore sectors were to be under state undertakings and some government regulated industries producing basic importance goods and the rest to be under private ownership. This policy protected Indian industries, created a sustainable premise for the setting up and uh, the future of the industrial sector. And between these created immense competitiveness among various participants in the industrial sector as well. Restrictions of foreign investment and these factors together fueled a buoyant, unstoppable and fierce industrial growth in India. As the main industries grew, the support and the ancillary ones grew too, and with it, the supply chain, logistics sector, transport, various markets, service sector, industrial townships, and the constructions, and such other infrastructure, generating employment for millions of people as they started to migrate from villages to towns to gain employment. There were other industrial policies, but that of 1991 was unique as it liberalized foreign investments as a result of the FDI have steadily increased. And now in some industries, up to 100 percent FDI is allowed. If we see the industrial policies in India since 1948, then 1956, 1977, 1980, and from 1991, there has been a marked shift from socialistic approach to a capitalist one. While enjoying a vibrant, privileged, and enviable democracy during the last 75 years, as we celebrate Asad Ki Amrit Mahotsav, there were many turning points and milestones that helped India as a nation where she is today as the world's fifth largest economy. In the area of banking, some of the notable time marks are nationalization of the Reserve Bank of India in 1949, followed by the nationalization of banks in 1969 and 1980. Banking was a nationalized sector till 93, when HDFC received approval for setting up private sector banks, Indusind Bank was established in 19 uh, was established in India as a private sector bank in 1994. Since 1991, the banking sector was liberalized. The Imperial Bank of India, formed by merging of three banks established by the East India Company, was in 1995 nationalized and called the State Bank of India. Besides. Special function banks were set up like the NABRD to support agricultural activities, Exim to promote export-import activities and others, such as to promote housing projects, among others. All these gave a big push to the commerce of the day. Banks have played a vital role in India's economic development and growth. India always had a robust banking system, that the one that existed at the time of independence. Interestingly, Kautilya's Arthashastra, a 400 BC Sanskrit treatise, contained references of lending, 
lending rates, lenders, creditors, and banking norms. This book also talks about the accounting norms and government treasury. So this indicates that India has a rich tradition of banking sector, banking science with scientific accounting and audit and treasury practices even times as back as 400 BC. Nowadays, banks in India offer all the services offered by banks elsewhere in the world, like various facilities for imports and exports, personal, business and mortgage loans, and other such facilities required for day-to-day -day operations in the country. Banks are now easily accessible as they have advanced computer software and financial technology. Their turnaround times have steadily decreased and is probably fast approaching a real-time based scenario. Today, Banks in India handles a variety of documentary credits, import-export documentation, and other functions, including raising capital and wealth enhancing and managing instruments and products. All these helps providing liquidity to India's economy. In the area of industry and technology, the initiation of industry policy resolution of 1948, 1956, and several other IPAs set the tone for the industrial development and as a corollary, technological progress in India. Some of the milestones that India saw was the first atomic reactor going critical in 1956, production of the first passenger car by Hindustan Motors in 1958, and commissioning of the first integrated steel plant in Rorkela in 1960, Bakra Nangal Dam becoming operational in 1963, and um, other such important infrastructures that gave India a solid foundation for her journey forward. The results of these foundations are clearly visible today as we all see India marching forward, full throttle, at an amazing pace. Probably even the founding fathers of this industrial and agricultural revolution, which was being given shape on the drawing board in 1948, could not have anticipated that their planning and efforts would catapult India to these new heights, benefiting billions of people in India and beyond. Then came the impetus for a high quality modern education on par with the best of the world. This was needed to fuel India's growth as a nation and to give her the seat she deserves in the world order, recognition, and in plurality of economies and those factors that will eventually benefit mankind, not only in India, but the world over. The first Indian Institute of Technology was set up in Kharagpur in 1950, and in the following years followed with more IITs in various parts of the country. Students who were yearning to get a world-class engineering and technical education could now get them in India within the reach of their affordability. Technology, machines, people, factors of production, applied economies and finance to industry, and to make these industries viable and sustainable, there was a need to educate and train the technical managers and others who would manage these industries and other factors, lessons in modern management. Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, now Kolkata, was set up in 1961 and other IIMs followed thereafter. Besides IITMs and IIMs, numerous other educational institutions of higher and specialized learning, both specific domain and general, were set up in India in the period between 1947 and 2023. And these gave additional educational muscle power to India eventually elevating India to select few countries with high quality education. It is indeed visible today as some of the biggest corporations and in industries worldwide are run by India educated industry leaders. Some of the best universities and institutions worldwide have India educated teachers delivering state of the art education, training and skills development, passionately to millions of students worldwide, eventually benefiting mankind in their quest for knowledge and to find gainful life and prosperity. Surprisingly, all these endeavors were running on different tracks simultaneously, as if several trains being dispatched on several tracks with a mandate to achieve the best in their domains, no matter what the odds were. 
these hypothetical trains pulled up their throttle to the maximum and probably achieved their targets with more speed and efficiency than they were ever mandated to. To recount one of the earlier stories of one of those hypothetical trains mandated to attain currency and technology and to make up for the lost time goes like this. The launch location, Tumba. A small fishing village in Kerala, a launch pad, made in fields of coconut groves. The main office for scientists in charge of the launch, a local church. Workshop and laboratory, a bishop's office and adjacent cattle sh shed. And how were the parts of the rocket transported by scientists? On bicycles. Yes, this is the story of our first sounding rocket that kick-started the Indian space program in 1963. The first batch of engineers comprising of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, who later was our fond president of India, and a few and several other scientists, all of whom later became pioneers in their domain, later in the space exploration and the technology. Vikram Sarabhai and Satish Dhawan were the founding authors of this space script, and later other scientists propelled the script with amazing pace. Fast forward to 2017, and India broke the world record and deployed 104 satellites in sun-synchronous orbits in a single mission. From the window of time, we see a nation of 1.4 billion called India striding fast, and that makes us glued to our window to watch her pace of enchanting and enthralling spins to a modern, developed, and a moral nation. Sit by this window, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot to come, so don't go away. The other milestones were commencement of oil production of Bombay High, sh High Offshore in 1976 and commissioning of our first public sector refinery at Gauhati in 1962, feeding India's oil and allied product requirements as a part of oil commerce, trade, and move to self-sufficiency. Independent and young India saw a spectacular and steady growth over the following years in the refining sector. From the days of 2001, when India experienced deficit in refining capacity to today, when the nation has achieved self-sufficiency and is a major exporter of petroleum products, it has been quite an exemplary leap today. India's refining capacity is fourth largest in the world. Coming to aviation, today India is the fastest growing aviation market in the world and stands at third position worldwide. After the reforms of 1994 in aviation sector, there were, there were a lot of other competing airlines to the already existing government-run airlines like Air India and Indian Airlines. This brought in market forces like competitiveness, quality, choice, and such other dynamics fueling growth of this sector, bringing it to the third position worldwide today. And along with it, its supply chain and tourism and its attending commerce provides an encouraging contribution to India's GDP. This sector also generates millions of direct and indirect jobs. Speaking of um, maritime industry, in independent India's first shipbuilding factory was Hindustan Shipyard Limited, established in 1952. Maritime transport handles approximately 70 to 75 percent of India's trade with other nations. Currently, some mega projects or mega ports are under construction, besides the 12 major ports and numerous intermediate ports. The government of India is making major initiatives for expansion of shipping and inland waterways on public-private partnership model. Today, India stands at 17th position worldwide in shipping sector while being one of the top five in ship recycling countries globally, holding approximately one thirds of the share in the global market in the sector. In economy, commerce and capital market sector, the Bombay Stock Exchange and National Stock Exchange plays a vital role. The stock exchange provides price stability to the securities and liquidity and help companies and businesses raise capital from the market. They also indicate 
the confidence in the economy of the day. Bombay Stock Exchange is the oldest stock exchange, ranks among the top stock exchanges in the world, having a market capitalization of approximately 3.83 trillion US dollars. Another stock exchange under Securities and Exchange Board of India, the Regulatories of Security Markets in India, is National Stock Exchange, established in 1992. NSE has a market capitalization of approximately 3.4 trillion US dollars. BSC, Sensex, and um, Nifty are the indices of these stock exchanges, respectively, and they're very, very helpful to understand how the economy in general is going and what are the market sentiments of the day. Today, India is one of the fastest growing tech hubs in India. Software exports alone contributed a revenue of about US dollars 156 billion in the year 2021-22. Today, India has a place of pride in this sector and a robust export that further consolidates India's position on the world stage. Communication technology and consumption is yet another giant leap by India, and today it's the second largest in the world by a number of telephone users. 5G technology has already been rolled out, and shortly people in India will be able to derive the benefits of this technology. Now, we also see India's investments being made in other countries through business acquisitions or simply by investing in other countries in various sectors. Now, India is also joining the global race to manufacture uh, semiconductor chips, and these plants in India are expected to become operational shortly. India is poised to become a major global economy as today's India's economy is growing at an estimated 7% or thereabout, and probably is today's one of the best growth rates worldwide. These are the results of application of a recent and robust scientific and logical approaches to technology, commerce, education and training, fiscal policy, management and discipline that has enabled India to reach this point in development. To reach to this level, the hard work put in by people of India, the institutions and the planning, encouragement and charting of courses by our wise leaders in almost every sphere, be it education, manufacturing, services, technology, travel, logistics, space technology, healthcare, pharmaceutical industries have to be greatly appreciated. By the way, India is the biggest exporter of generic medicines in the world as well. More technological advancements in almost all sectors are yet to come and they will create more prosperity and wealth in India. It has been an interesting story till now and will be more accomplishing and amazing in the coming years. Thank you all once again for this wonderful opportunity. And may I take this opportunity to wish all the presenters of today's conference the very best. Thank you, and God bless you all.